Hi, this is part three of lecture four of applied machine learning. Now in uh, this part of the lecture, we're going to look at a few uh, reasons for why supervised learning might not work. In the previous video, we gave a general argument for, uh, well, first of all, we defined what it means for supervised learning to work, what it means to have an accurate model, and then we gave a high level sketch of a proof for why supervised uh, for why applying supervised learning will, with high probability, output accurate models. Now, uh, in this part of the uh, lecture, we're going to look at slightly, uh, we're going to take somewhat of, a, of an opposite angle, and we're going to see uh, a few failure modes of supervised learning and how we can mitigate them. So recall that we, uh, that a really key concept in machine learning is generalization. And uh, in order for a model to be accurate, it has to generalize. So specifically, we assume uh, that uh, the data set, uh, that our training data set, or in fact, the data in general, is described by a probability distribution P. Uh, and we have access to, or our training data set is a set of samples from this distribution. And then we also have another sample that's distinct, which is called the holdout set. And if the model generalizes uh, it means that it is accurate on the holdout set, and this rep this means that uh, the model will be providing us with accurate predictions when we deploy it in the real world, and we're going to see uh, new data that is distinct from what we have seen at training. Uh, now, let's look at an example of uh, what happens to generalization when we fit one of the models that we saw earlier in this, uh, in this course, uh, in particular polynomial regression. Um, recall that in polynomial regression, uh, here I'm defining it in one dimension, so we're just going to fit a, a curve, uh, a one-dimensional curve going from x to y, okay, so going from a real number to a real number. And uh, in polynomial regression, we fit a model of this form, uh, which is linear in a set of features phi. And these features phi are uh, themselves nonlinear. They, uh, they go from uh, r to a higher dimensional uh, um, uh, space uh, and uh, if we choose uh, a set of features that has this form then we can uh, then this uh, then the, the class of models of this form corresponds to the set of polynomials of degree at most p so by uh, and, and then we saw that we can use our machinery for fitting uh, least squares model to fit uh, nonlinear models of this form, which are polynomials. So why would we use polynomial uh, models? Um, as you can imagine, as we switch from linear models to polynomials, we can fit the data much better, and therefore we can increase the accuracy of our models. Uh, to, to give you an example of what I mean, let's again revisit the same example we've been using in the previous videos. Here we have this curve, and I've sampled uh, this training set that, um, that I showed you earlier. It's shown here in blue. And now let's consider fitting a few, a few models, a few polynomial models to this data set. So here uh, I'm fitting uh, a, polynomial, a polynomial of degree one, which is just a straight line, which is just which is just a line, a polynomial of degree two and a polynomial of degree three, and you can see that as we increase the degree of the polynomial, here the uh, clearly this function is nonlinear, and so this uh, this linear model doesn't really uh, provide us with a good fit. But now, uh, when I increase the degree of the polynomial to two, already we're able to capture the main. Uh, you know the main flexion of the curve here much better, and now if I if I set the degree to three, then we're uh, we're fitting the curve very very closely, um, and here you can see the uh, the numpy the Python numpy and scikit-learn uh, code that I used in order to generate these three polynomials. Um, essentially, I just uh, created a set of polynomial features, which is a uh, which is something that comes from the scikit-learn library, and then a fit a linear regression on top of it. So it's it's using the same algorithm that we uh, that we saw earlier underneath the hood, but I'm just relying on a standard machine learning library uh, on scikit-learn. So the takeaway here is that 
increasing the uh, expressiveness, the expressivity of our model helps us to better fit the data. And so let's see what happens if we now increase the capacity of our model even further. Uh, let's now consider polynomials of an even higher degree. So here I'm now fitting a polynomial of degree 30. So this is, uh, this is a very, very high degree polynomial. It has, it has degree 30. And you can see here that it fits the data really well, right? So here it hits this point perfectly, and this one, and this one. And, and uh, at all of these points, it fits the curve. Uh, it, it fits the data almost perfectly. But now you can also see that uh, we have a problem. The orange curves look, uh, the orange curve looks nothing like the true curve here, which is in blue. Um, we have the, these really, really uh, massive um, fluctuations, these, these massive changes in the value of our of the orange curve, which is our which is the model that we have fit. Uh, and even though it's correct at the blue points, its predictions are wildly inaccurate. It's way off the blue curve at uh, everywhere else except at these blue points. And so now this is clearly problematic because this orange line is unlike anything that's, that's in the true data set. So this, here, uh, this example here shows why increasing model capacity is not the only uh, thing that we need to care about. Again, here in this example, we were able to fit the data perfectly, but its predictions were simply horrible. So what does it mean? The example that I gave you is an instance of what is called machine learning overfitting. And overfitting is, a, is one of the main concepts that, that, that you need to understand in order to apply machine learning in practice. Overfitting is a hugely important concept in machine learning, and it's perhaps one of the most important failure modes of a machine learning algorithm. Uh, again, essentially, the idea is that when we overfit the data, we're able to fit our training data set perfectly, but doing so uh, makes the model wildly inaccurate in areas that are outside our training region, and therefore the model doesn't generalize. Overfitting is also closely related to another concept called underfitting. And underfitting is essentially the problem that we saw at the very beginning when we tried to fit a linear model to the data. So in that example, we tried to fit a straight line, but the straight line did not fit the data well at all uh, because the true function was much more complex. And so this model will also not be accurate on uh, new data because uh, if it doesn't fit the training data well, um, the held out data will come from the same distribution and the model will, not, will also not be accurate on that data. And so finding the trade-off between overfitting and underfitting is one of the main challenges in applying machine learning. And finding uh, the right balance between the two is, uh, is, one of the main, um, is one of the main problems that you need to solve in order to have a machine learning system that works well in practice. Um, and, and again, an example of what, of what an accurate model would be here is uh, it would be uh, it would be some in in the earlier example with the polynomial uh, functions that we that were fitting our curve, uh, a model that is neither overfitting or, nor underfitting would be one that follows the curve smoothly, but is not uh, providing any but 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 doesn't have any of these wild fluctuations that we saw earlier. Uh, it would be something like the polynomial of degree three that we saw at the very beginning. So how can we tell that our model is overfitting or underfitting? Um, I, we're going to revisit this much more closely later in the course when we're going to talk about how to deploy and analyze and debug and improve machine learning models in practice. But at a high level, uh, a model is overfitting, has really high training performance. But if we take a holdout set, the performance on that holdout set is going to be really low. Um, and this holdout set is something that we can either uh, create ourselves or it's something that we're going to encounter once we deploy the model in the real world. And finally, uh, uh, and, uh, at the same time, conversely, <coughs> underfitting means that our training performance is going to be low and therefore the performance on the holdout set is going to be low as well. 
So here I am again showing an example of overfitting and underfitting on uh, on a holdout set. Here uh, again we have I have exactly the same curve and the same training set, and now I am plotting a small number of um, of uh, holdout samples in red here, and I am fitting three models. On the left, I'm fitting a simple linear model, and clearly this model is not very accurate on the red points uh, because it's simply not flexible enough to capture the true shape of the data. And so here, if we compute the mean squared error on this holdout set, we have a value of about 0 0.2. Now, if I fit a polynomial of degree 20, again, we have this crazy uh, curve which looks nothing unlike the true data, and here we have a massive holdout error. And finally, uh, a better polynomial uh, fit here is one that has degree 5, and if we fit this data, we now have a holdout error of 0.01, which is the lowest of the three. And also visually, we see that the orange, uh, the orange line fits, uh, that, that it passes really closely to all of the red points. And also it matches the uh, shape of the true curve, which we know here. So overfitting and underfitting are two really important problems that we have to deal with, with that we have to deal with in machine learning. How do we address these problems? In this course, we're going to see a lot of strategies, but uh, for in this video, let me just give you a high level, uh, a few high level examples. Um, so if we're if we have a model that's underfitting the data, uh, the solution is to increase our uh, the class of models that we consider and add more complex models to this class. So for example, this could be a set of, uh, this could be nonlinear models, uh, or it could be models that are linear, but that use more expressive features. Um, so for example, uh, the, the polynomial features that you saw earlier are an example of, a, of, of more complex features, although it's also closely related to uh, using more expressive models. But we could also use our own intuition to handcraft certain features. So for example, if we, this was an example of the diabetes, and we knew that uh, men with, um, uh, that old men were particularly at risk of diabetes, but our linear model could not combine the feature men and feature age, uh, we could create this feature manually such that a linear model would be able to account for the fact that being an old man is an important risk factor and assign it a proper weight. Uh, in order to deal with overfitting, we have to do the opposite. We have to find a way of reducing the complexity of our models by reducing the size or the complexity of the model class M. Essentially, our model class has models which are too expressive relative to the size of our training uh, of our training set and that are able to fit this training set perfectly we need to reduce our uh, the size of the models that we consider in order to um, in order to restrict ourselves to models that generalize better one way of it one way of doing this is to directly change the class of models that we consider so for example we could go from using a highly nonlinear machine learning algorithm our uh, supervised learning algorithm that works with nonlinear models, we could change it. We could change it to a different supervised learning algorithm, which only works with linear models, or we could also find a way of uh, penalizing these complex models by keeping the same model class but changing our objective function such that it is incentivized to choose the models that are simpler. This second way of dealing with overfitting is actually really important, and it's something that's widely used in practice. And that is something that I want to talk about in more detail in the subsequent videos.